October 1st, 2019. China celebrates its 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. It's a day of immense significance as the people paid homage to the Communist Party's leadership. After a century of humiliation, China is now marching forward with its newfound confidence and vigor as a new global power. From a war-battered and poverty-stricken nation on the verge of collapse, to a leading industrial powerhouse and the world's second largest economy in a span of just 70 years. I think they can still celebrate the fact that they've had extraordinary success with their economic growth over the last 40 years. And today, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, China pushes the envelope to achieve what he called the China Dream. We now have another very capable and very courageous leader, a leader with great vision. What really accounts for China's meteoric rise as a major global power within seven decades? Can this dramatic success be sustained in today's challenging global economic environment? With this transformation, what has been gained along the way, what has been lost along the way? Now, as China celebrates its 70th anniversary, has China arrived? Is it still a work in progress? A picturesque farming village, alluring mountain ranges, breathtaking views of the valleys and the lush green fields greet visitors in this old town of Shidu, some 300 kilometers away from Beijing, China's capital city. This was how the whole of China looked like 70 years ago a predominantly agricultural country with the majority of its population living in the countryside. That was also what Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong inherited when he proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949. Despite his remarkable success in defeating the nationalist Kuomintang forces and unifying the whole country under the leadership of the Communist Party, China remained a very poor and backward country. More than 80% of the Chinese people lived in absolute poverty. I would say he inherited a mess. What made the difference was he created something. He created something that uh, China had not seen for nearly 100 years, a united country. It had been divided after the Opium War, Civil War inside, even under the Qing Dynasty. And then the revolution, warlords, civil war, invasion by the Japanese. It was one long tale of disasters, wars, poverty, increasingly dismal future for China. China was at its weakest, in fact, during those years of the Japanese invasion and the civil war that followed. I mean, in 1945 to 49, when the nationalists and communists fought, the nationalists were obviously so weak and so corrupt, they had no real chance of defeating, of winning, 
although nobody quite anticipated the speed at which they fell. But the, the fact that the communists won is Mao Zedong's creation. He made that possible. In the 10 years that followed the founding of the People's Republic of China, Chairman Mao set the country on the tremendous growth trajectory. Industrial output was growing double digit every year. But the great leap forward, the industrialization of China, soon began to falter. Within the party, when they had disagreements among their leaders, and the mistakes that Mao Zedong made with the great leap forward, and then when his comrades challenged him about that, he didn't like it. He was, he was got more and more deeply embroiled in a kind of internal party struggle, which led to the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution, however, failed to repair the damage caused by his economic policy of the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was Mao's vision of the rapid industrialization of China, but at the expense of agriculture. The failure of the economic experiment brought with it the Great Chinese Famine of 1959, which lasted till 1961. The Cultural Revolution that followed only made the situation worse. The 10-year social experiment crippled the Chinese economy, which led to a prolonged period of turmoil, bloodshed and starvation. Sixty-five-year-old retiree He Chun-lu was only in his teens when the Cultural Revolution was first introduced. But he could see how his family suffered as a result of the policy, which failed to bring about tangible economic benefits to poor people like himself. Shangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangshangsh
the policy that paralyzed China politically and economically finally ended in 1976 following the death of Mao Zedong and the fall of the Gang of Four, a group of Chinese Communist Party members closely associated with Mao. Although the end of the Cultural Revolution came at the cost of so many lives, until today, Mao remains a revered figure in China. Despite the errors and the miscalculations of the Cultural Revolution and so on, they didn't actually destroy that base of a sense of unity, a sense of oneness of China, a sense of tremendous potential. Even though he got it wrong, the sense was somehow still there. After his success in reuniting China, Mao Zedong had envisioned that his revolutionary movement would turn the country into a beacon of communism, a prosperous country committed to the communist ideology. He failed. But his failure to realize his vision had paved the way for the rise of a new leader, whose radical reform policies led to the emergence of China as a new economic superpower. The man responsible for China's meteoric rise was 74-year-old Deng Xiaoping, formerly the Secretary General of the Communist Party. But who was Deng Xiaoping? How would his decision to open up China to the world change the country's destiny forever? China's phenomenal transformation into a modern, industrialized economy did not happen by accident. It was made possible by the work and ideas of one man, the late Chinese paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping. Standing at just 1.52 meters tall, his diminutive figure belied the strength, vision and fortitude of the man who helped transform China into one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Deng Xiaoping was indeed a giant among equals, towering above the achievements of many other leaders in modern times. With his courage, vision and ideas, he helped lay the foundation for the rise of China into an economic superpower that it is today. In a way, they learned from the mistakes of Mao Zedong to follow Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping actually thought for 10 years, he sat down and thought about what went wrong with what had been so successful. Don't forget, Deng Xiaoping was the Secretary General of the party while Mao Zedong was the chairman for 10 years. So he could see from inside something that was tremendously hopeful, tremendous potential, virtually destroyed by, in a way, the madness of this one man. The man who created it also was about to destroy it. And he sat back those 10 years quietly, thinking of how do I remedy this? How do I save China, save the Communist Party from this near ruin that this great man who had created it in the first place had almost destroyed? Victor Gao is a vice president of the Center for China and Globalization, a think tank in Beijing but he was previously an English translator to the late paramount leader Deng Xiaoping during the 1980s. Victor observed firsthand that despite Mr. Deng's demeanor as a calm and gentle old man, he commanded tremendous respect on his peers with his unwavering determination to achieve his vision. He was a man of great wisdom and he was a man was with great vision for China. I've described Deng Xiaoping as the prophet for the Chinese nation, mainly because he saw where most of us could not see, and he pointed out a way of development, which eventually was proven not only to be the correct one. Deng Xiaoping took up the mantle of the leadership of the Communist Party at the age of 74. At that age, Victor felt that Deng was a man in a hurry to achieve something for the country. 
His main priority was to lift China out of its economic rut and pull millions of its people out of poverty. And he knew time was not long left for him. So he needed to act very fast. He had no time to waste. And he also believed that China or the Chinese nation would have no time to waste anymore. Everyone need to wake up. Everyone need to have that sense of crisis, a sense of urgency. Everyone need to move forward as quickly as he or she can. Deng Xiaoping appreciated that he was not building from something from scratch. He was building from something that was there, but went wrong, and he's remedying that. And so he did. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping abandoned many communist doctrine and embraced free market principles instead. From state ownership and a centrally planned economy to one based on market-oriented reforms. In other words, Deng went against the grains of communist ideology by legalizing private ownership. He allowed market competition and opened China to the world through foreign investments and trade. He famously remarked, it does not matter whether they are black cats or white cats. So long as they catch mice, they're good cats. There were the four dragon in Asia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. So they developed very fast and quickly became the manufacturing center of the world. So Deng saw that and he wants to follow a similar path. So he adopted very similar industrial policies by building domestic manufacturing base uh, and using agriculture to subsidize industry. So by doing that, um, he lowered the cost of uh, economic input for industrial development. And also he opened a border. Uh, he opened uh, the coastal uh, provinces, especially through uh, Shenzhen. And by doing that, he captured uh, this export, uh, this rising export economy. And that was a breaking point for China. It ended up setting up special economic zones, um, getting China started on a trajectory of manufacturing success, of exporting to the rest of the world. It lifted over 600 million Chinese out of extreme poverty. It's a kind of economic development that gave the nation control over its own destiny. He had recognized that that was one of the mistakes of Mao Zedong, to have closed up the economy. If you don't have the capitalism or the methodologies and technologies of capitalism to create the wealth, what is there to redistribute? We must get to the stage when we must create wealth. And what he did was he basically opened the doors to say, let everybody who can create wealth, create wealth. Only then we have a chance to build a social society. And Chinese people, being what they are, with all their entrepreneurial instincts, having been suppressed for a while now, is being told to say, told that this is okay now, go ahead. Have you got new ideas? They can be entrepreneurial? Go ahead. And my goodness, they did. 33-year-old Alex Ma works in his family's printing and packaging business in Shenzhen. His father and uncle, who hailed from Chaozhou province, first started up their business in Hong Kong in the 1970s. But they took a gamble by moving their production to Shenzhen on the new promise of the special economic zones designed by Deng Xiaoping. Back in the 1980s, Shenzhen was a fishing village, dwarfed by the mature and liberal economy of its neighbor, Hong Kong. Nobody knew if it was going to work out. But today, Alex has seen how the place and the business has grown from strength to strength, thanks to Mr. Deng's foresight. To the point, the Deng 
And so Deng's gamble in converting a planned economy into a market economy paid off. From a per capita income of just 40 US dollars in 1978, it has now risen to more than 10,000 US dollars. The country's economy has also expanded at an average rate of 9.5% over the last 40 years. The changes that Deng had initiated have transformed China from one of the world's poorest countries into the world's second biggest economy. As a testimony to the success of Deng's reform efforts, Shenzhen has surpassed Hong Kong in GDP numbers for the first time in history. And Shenzhen's success formula has been implemented in second and third tier cities across China. Shenzhen turned out to be the most successful special economic zone in the Chinese experience. And by today, a small fishing village in Shenzhen had already blossomed into a mega city. Shenzhen is larger than Hong Kong in terms of the size, in terms of the size of the population, but also very importantly, starting in 2018, Shenzhen's GDP is already larger than Hong Kong. So this is truly a revolutionary development for Shenzhen. However, in the spring of 1989, pro-democracy protests broke out on Tiananmen Square, casting a pall over China's nascent market economy and liberal reforms. Chinese students had begun to demand for political reforms amid the ambitious economic reforms spearheaded by Deng. The central government, however, viewed the demonstrations as an existential challenge and went on to crush the movement. Because the, the Tiananmen era was that they were so afraid that they opened up too fast and people were getting the wrong idea and the wrong direction, so they had to crush it. But then, then people began to be fearful about moving forward. Deng left no room for doubt on China's way forward. The red line was cast in stone and could not be crossed. While he was prepared to allow for market reforms, there can be no challenge to the party's rule. But that has not stopped China's economic ascent as the next generation of Chinese leaders continue to ride on this expansionist wave, taking communist China to the halls of the World Trade Organization, integrating China deeper into the global economy. When Deng Xiaoping retired from politics in 1992, he had fulfilled a mission no other leader of the 20th century could have ever done. His groundbreaking reforms and his decision to open up China to the world have left a lasting impact on the country. It's not surprising then that his death in February 1997 did not lead to the abandonment of his economic policies. In fact, it further inspired the government to continue the material progress for the nation under new leader Jiang Zemin. Together with economic czar Zhu Rongji, they both took China to new heights. And he sold the idea to a whole gener a new generation of people who now are the leaders. He says successors, the generation from Jiang Zemin to Xi Jinping, are all in a way products of that new way of thinking to build on the revolution that has succeeded, but constantly tweak it, make it better, improve it on it, to ensure that it takes full advantages of all the opportunities available by opening up. I think that era is also um, strengthened in terms of its signal opening up um, by Premier Zhu Rongji, because he's probably the bravest reformer at the time. He conducted uh, the state owned enterprise reform, uh, which caused millions of unemployment, but he somehow pu uh, pulled it through and uh, with a lot of political support domestically. He's very charismatic. 46-year-old Zhong Fu Chen is very much a self-made businessman who's very successful in his own right. 
he has tried his hand at different industries, from trading cultural arts and crafts to agriculture and eggs production. Zheng, who grew up in Gansu, one of the poorest landlocked provinces in northwest China, is the owner of a few businesses and sits on advisory boards of national trade organizations. Zhong's success mirrored the country's phenomenal growth over the last decades. He attributes his success to the environment and circumstances in those years, where China was rapidly opening up to the world, while taking the best of what other more advanced countries could offer. Huanjing很重要 a major breakthrough came in December 2001, when China formally joined the World Trade Organization, or WTO. Its ascension into the WTO clearly signified China's deeper integration into the global economy and cemented its position as the world's factory attracting numerous manufacturing companies from advanced economies into China. Joining the World Trade Organization, they suddenly took advantage of the whole opening of the world's market to Chinese entrepreneurship and access to all the world's resources. Following the rules, all the countries open up their markets to China, particularly the developed world of the United States and Western Europe. And those markets was really what made it possible for the Chinese economy to take off in such a rapid pace from then onwards. For the next 15 years or so, it just got shot up. And you can see the figures show it. They show that after joining WTO, how, how, how things move very, very far, faster than anybody expected. However, China's blistering growth, averaging 9.8% per annum, as well as its economic expansion that went on at such a brickneck speed had begun to raise red flags. As it got richer, there were growing concerns over corruption and income inequality. So one could say that that whole generation attempted to keep the economic engine growing and that the real opportunity for genuine reform uh, only came towards the end of that era with Hu Jintao and Wen Jiapao looking for ways to repair a system that had clearly grown unbalanced. Was investment too much an engine of growth? There was the government bloat in state-owned enterprises already too large? Was the environment too degraded? Had income inequality risen too high? This wealth, this new wealth that was created, was corrupting the party itself. Now, this is really dangerous. It was against this backdrop that the leadership baton was passed onto the fifth generation. In November 2012, 59-year-old princeling Xi Jinping, the son of a communist revolutionary veteran, became China's new paramount leader. Shortly upon assuming power, President Xi Jinping embarked on an all-out anti-corruption drive aimed at rooting out corruption within the party. In five years, more than 200,000 high and low-ranking officials known as Tigers and Flies were prosecuted. Former Chongqing boss and member of the Politburo, Bo Xilai, a former member of the Politburo Standing Committee, Zhou Yongkang, 
and former vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, General Xi Taiho. In spite of growing criticisms that his anti-corruption drive was aimed at getting rid of his rivals and those who are resistant to his policies, the campaign has won praises from the people. I conducted several surveys in rural China, and everywhere you go, people, they just love Xi. Um, they think it's easier now to uh, get their things done in the government, and they think anti-corruption is a good thing. Having struck the right note at the very start of his leadership, Xi Jinping launched several signature policies in quick succession. These included Made in China 2025, a strategic blueprint to upgrade the country's manufacturing capabilities. This would include the goal of rising dominance in the fields of technology, IT and robotics. The Belt and Road Initiative, an ambitious global development strategy to build infrastructure and connectivity in 152 countries. These are all part of his desire to achieve the China dream and the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. China dream uh, is not one person dream, not his own, only his, his own idea, but just represent all the people of China. So the China dream for the macro, at the macro level, when we say, when we are talking about it, I think it should be understand as the regionalization, the renaissance of China's civilization is a long history. China may come, as in, in, in Xi Jinping's own world, that we are come closer to the center of the world stage. Two years into Xi Jinping's term, unexpected headwinds appeared on the horizon. In 2014, the Chinese economy grew at its slowest pace in 24 years, although it still clocked in a respectable 7.4% growth. And in 2016, the United States voted in a president who accused China of stealing jobs from America and cheating on trade deals. For all his tough anti-China rhetoric on the election campaign trail, Nobody really believed that Donald Trump will make good on his threats on China. But he did. In July 2018, President Trump slapped taxes on billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports. And the two countries have been engaged in round after round of tit-for-tat retaliation measures since. And with no foreseeable end in sight to the trade war, Chinese manufacturers like Alex Ma are getting increasingly worried. The Chinese economy has undoubtedly been hit. GDP for the second quarter of 2019 grew at 6.2%, the lowest rate since quarterly reports began in 1992. Oh, the impact will be profound. In fact, you feel the impact right now. Probably when you are in China, most people want to talk to you about US-China trade war because it's affecting people's daily life, it's affecting sentiment, and that's affecting stock market. And as China celebrates its 70th anniversary of the founding of the nation, 
What do these troubling times mean for the Chinese people and President Xi Jinping's lofty China dream? When President Xi Jinping started his term with his vision of the China dream, Zhong Guo Meng, it galvanized and inspired an entire nation. It conjured hope and self-confidence. But as the world's most populous country, some 1.4 billion people, China has different age groups, different dialects, different religions. Can it be one China dream for everybody? How will Xi Jinping's vision propel the nation forward? Power, wealth, and respect. That's what Chinese leader Xi Jinping has envisioned for his country and his 1.4 billion population when he took over the mantle of leadership in 2012. Just weeks after he was installed as the Secretary General of the Communist Party, Xi came up with a slogan, the China dream, and the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. His key objective, to achieve prosperity at home and respect on the world stage, a vision of an economically prosperous and militarily strong nation. Great means, in the eyes of the Chinese, is to be respected, to be looked up to, as a civilization or as a power, as a wealthy country, for all sorts of reasons, but people look up to China with respect, admiration or something like that. I think that's what the Chinese believe, that China has been treated that way for a long time, most of the time. They have their downs, but when they're doing well, people respect it and admire China. And for a hundred odd years, they were really down. So now they want to go back to the position when people will respect China. I think most Chinese leaders and intellectuals and so on want to restore that position. Evidence has shown that China has already gained international respect and global admiration for all its achievements over the last 40 years. From one of the poorest countries in the world, it's now on the verge of joining the ranks of a high-income country. From an economy that was based on agriculture, it has now established itself as a global technology and manufacturing powerhouse, contributing to nearly 30% of the world's economic growth. It has also successfully lifted 850 million people out of poverty and is on target to eradicate absolute poverty by the year 2020. China today is also the world's largest trading nation and an economy that's only second biggest in the world after the US. For Xu Zetao, who had gone through the Cultural Revolution, he's happy to witness the country's rapid transformation. And he attributes that to the drive and resilience of its people to be among the best in the world. Many people like me could never envision this today, right? We have been consistently underestimating China's economic potentials. And probably until today, I'm still underestimating China's economic resilience. That's number one. Number two, in many ways, I think society has become a lot more open. So that's the second achievement. Third achievement is really this continued drive. I think that's very different from many other countries. And there's still a very strong catch-up mentality. I think uh, China come from a very underdeveloped country with a poverty rate is so high. Now we really improved the wealth of the whole generation. We really, you know, put China into middle income country level. So in that sense, that's the single biggest achievement of China. 31-year-old Fan Yue and his wife, Shuang Yue, who run a skating and snowboarding school for children, are not particularly aware 
of the China Dream slogan. Still, they feel very inspired by the government's commitment to achieve the best for the country and are willing to partake in this common vision. I actually looked at the first time, and it's mainly about the country to be the country, the country to be the country, the people to be the people. I think this is a bit difficult. 这个话题比较空泛，所以说我们觉得就是每一个人去做自己就可以，然后把自己贡献自己的力量，然后让自己的生活好一点就可以了。因为现在，呃，我们觉得国家特别好，所以也没有说是去很应试的去响应口号，只要就是知道自己是谁，然后做自己该做的事情就行。因为我的父母他是，嗯，还是比较就是说。你要先入党啊，然后先怎么怎么样，然后在我们看来，可能就觉得这个呃不是特别的，就是必要，然后就觉得我们可以做自己喜欢的事儿更开心。But China's newfound wealth and confidence have also been matched by its growing assertiveness overseas. It has been flexing its muscle in every sphere, including its maritime claims in the South China Sea and East China Sea. Beijing has also been moving rapidly to upgrade its military hardware and expand its powers overseas. Xi's government has also invested heavily in the Belt and Road Initiative to expand its economic reach and soft power abroad. Domestically, Xi Jinping has emerged as the most powerful leader since the era of Mao Zedong. Apart from his position as president and secretary general of the party, he has also taken full control of the military, assuming the title of supreme commander. And in a marked departure from party tradition, Xi Jinping successfully removed the term limits for president, something which former leader Deng Xiaoping tried to prevent. The constitutional amendment would now allow him to stay in office as president indefinitely. If you are doing the job and the job is not finished, you continue. Why not? I do not believe that he just he's took off the limit so that he can be president for life. I think that's just people's you know his way of making fun of him. Because I don't think that's on his mind. What is on his mind is that these limits are artificial. They be borrowed from somewhere, but it really depends on the job you have to do. And I think he sees himself rightly or wrongly that he faced a party that was. Almost about to self-destruct, and he has said, almost a sacred task of saving that party in order to save China. That maybe five years, ten years, not good enough. Given the vast changes and the rapid changes, and also the way that Xi Jinping has led the party in fighting against the corruption, the greater continuity and stability we may have actually will help China the more. Rather than, for example, the uncertainty or the unpredictability, especially at the very top level of the Chinese leadership. But 2019 has proven to be a challenging year for President Xi. China today has to battle challenges on many fronts. Ethnic tensions in Xinjiang continue to simmer, as international human rights groups keep up the pressure on the Chinese authorities' handling of the Uyghur Muslims. Xi is also facing a challenge to his authority from China's special administrative region, Hong Kong. Months of anti-government protests by pro-democratic forces have threatened to undermine political stability in the former British colony. The festering trade war with the United States has also hit its economy hard, raising the specter of another global recession. As trade volumes plunge and major companies pause at their investments, but many in China are not worried. I think there are two sides to it. Any thing is not single sided. One side is our economy is getting bigger. The key is what? You look at the last few years, we have been building new technologies, advancing high tech, and doing a lot of innovation. And we have achieved a huge success. Don't say that it's not good. Many cities have done well. 啊，再一个，我们人工智能现在发展也不错
，而且人工智能现在，你看世界最大的，我忘了是五十家还是多少家，人工智能领先者，美国十七家，中国十家，那其他欧洲、日本都都落得很后面了，所以我们在这方面很有信心。当然，现在美国对中国要强了。啊，他不允许你这样，但这是挑战，总归有。但是我们这方面有，顺着这个路走，我们是有把握。This trade war also has some positive impact on China, because trade war is a stress test. Financial institutions they need to undertake stress test when asset value coming down, whether your institution can withheld such external pressure. Same for China. This trade war, I think, allows policymakers to look at reform agenda. The scale and grandeur of the 70th anniversary military parade in Tiananmen was truly a sight to behold. But even as President Xi Jinping and his team looked on his countrymen with confidence and pride, the challenges facing the country ahead are real and deep-rooted. But it's something that it is always ready and willing to face head on. We are preparing for the next 70 years and many, many more years to uh, come beyond that. I think you know, China is, after all, having the longest continuous civilization with 5,000 years of recorded history. And China is the only never interrupted civilization in the world. I would say that the dream is still the same dream. How do you make China great again? And in the last 70 years, after all the ups and downs of the different uh, periods, this part of it, I think, has really achieved, really succeeded in sinking roots in the minds and hearts of most Chinese people. And there is, and as long as that is there, there's always hope. As I talk to different generations of Chinese nationals, those who lived through the hardships of the Cultural Revolution, and those who were born in the 80s, the 90s, who were beneficiaries of Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, one thing that struck me was their self-confidence. Confidence in their own ability that is very much aligned with their belief in the country's ability. They're all keenly aware of how far China has come since 1949. Many of them did not believe they would see this transformation in their lifetime. In talking about current challenges, the US-China trade war intentions, for example, their responses are consistently measured. China, according to them, has been facing obstacles and hardships at every turn in their 5,000 years of civilization, and not just on this occasion of their 70th anniversary. This is but a small hiccup on the spectrum of time. Today, the Chinese society still exists in the world. There is no power to make us a great country. There is no power to make us a great country. There is no power to make us a great country. There is no power to make us a great country.